Good afternoon um, or morning or evening, depending on when you're watching this, if you're watching our recorded version. Um, my name is Bruce. I'm a business advisor here with the Small Business Development Center at Columbus State Community College. Um, and you are joining us for um, our special Small Business Week um, episode of our Small Business Spotlight Series. Uh, and this is an ongoing series. We offer this each month, and we take that opportunity to meet with a small business owner and get the inside scoop on what it means to be a small business owner, um, the uh, challenges and rewards of that experience, um, and, and hopefully help other small business owners make a, a easier go of their own venture. So um, our guest today is uh, Jeff White um, of Archaeology. Can you dig it? Um, get uh, Jeff on the screen here. There you go. Put me on the screen as well. Okay. Excellent. So, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, I'm sure you were busy. Um, the school's wrapping up here, so everybody's trying to cram in last minute special guests, right? Yep. Yep. I'm happy to be here. Again, thanks for the invite. I'm uh, appreciative of everybody that's here watching and everybody here that's going to be asking me questions and just inquiring about uh, archaeology. Can you dig it? Yeah, excellent. Well, thanks for taking time out to do this. Um, so um, let's start with a little background. Uh, can you tell us about yourself and what led you yeah. to start your business and what your business does? Yeah, absolutely. So again, my name is Jeff White. I am a archaeologist and anthropologist. Uh, as a kid, I was always interested in ancient Greece and ancient Rome and uh, ancient Egypt also. Uh, also, to be, to be perfectly honest, I wanted to be a veterinarian as a, as a child and uh, that, that passed me by. So with with Becoming an archaeologist, I graduated from University of West Florida in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, worked in the field almost 20 years, um, you know, all over the Southeast, all over the Midwest. And at that time, I realized that um, we weren't, African Americans weren't really being represented in that field of study. So over that time period, I worked with about seven of us. And I'd already had a background working with uh, Columbus Public Schools in Columbus, Ohio, before I'd moved to Pensacola. And so I just had a brainchild about basically creating a program and a business that uh, reaches kids and teaches them about anthropology, archaeology, everything about history, and uh, using my skill set to teach them and educate them through hands-on uh, science activities as well. Excellent. Um, do you focus on a specific age group? Um, is it any, uh, any student in, in Central Ohio? So great question. So I've been lucky enough to teach, uh, actually, from, from nursery up to about 10th grade. So nursery is gonna be a little more difficult than uh, your, your 10th grader. But uh, basically what I do is I kind of use my programming to uh, reach whatever age group that we're talking to. So I'm not gonna talk to you know a nursery age student about uh, burials as much as I would a eighth grader or a sixth grader or even a, a high schooler as well. So it, it, it works really well because all the activities that I choose can be catered to different age groups. And uh, it just depends on how much information I want to want to flood their flood their heads and their brains with. Okay, so your um, your content then would shift according to age group and interest. Now, do you let them guide um, what you talk about? <clears throat> I mean, if they express an interest in a particular you know area of archaeology or anthropology, do you focus there? So yeah, so actually that that is actually um, accurate as well. I come in with a lesson plan. And what I like most about it is that it kind of takes its own form, uh, depending on what group of uh, students you're working with, or whether it's Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or different school groups or church groups. I kind of let them use their mind and their imagination when we're talking about archaeology and working in, in these dig pits or uh, throwing at lateral spears or whatnot. I just kind of talk to them about, you know, prehistoric times, historic times, and then I like to hear what they have to say and what they know about it. And then we sort of go ahead and build on from what they already know. And hopefully, you know, from someone coming in that has no knowledge about archaeology or anthropology, uh, hopefully they leave with a better understanding of what it means. And if the folks that come in with an understanding or uh, some experience, uh, maybe watching a site or, or volunteering at a site, excuse me, or watching uh, archaeological dig on TV or whatnot, that it builds on uh, their expertise and knowledge of the field as well. Because it's all about, you know, it's all about a puzzle and a story. And explaining to folks as to why that's important. We all have our own personal stories. Uh, all ethnicities have own, their own personal stories that are very important, but uh, history is definitely not something that should be forgotten. So again, using archaeology and anthropology and all these hands-on uh, programs options allows me to see, engage what they know, and also, again, build on that knowledge and hopefully create a 
a wonder and a uh, curiosity for the field. And hopefully I've reached or anyone like me doing this uh, has reached some folks to, to go ahead and get involved in the field. Excellent, that's great. Um, so how long have you been doing this? How long have you been, um, as archeology, span can you dig it? How long has this been doing its yeah. thing? So I started it in, honestly, in my field school. So for us, our field school in archeology span is like an internship for a college. We, I worked on Pensacola Beach. Uh, we were, at the time, it was the longest in the country. Ours was 13 weeks long. And <clears throat> so that's when this sort of came to me, this, this, this program at that point in time. So I knew before I graduated that I already wanted to do this. Uh, but obviously, you have to get your footing working in the field. Um, a lot of summers is where we're most busy working in the field. But I worked with a great uh, company here. And now this is when I moved back to Columbus, a great company here called ASC Group. And they were integral in loaning me artifacts. Um, they donated screens. They, they would loan shovels to me. And they were grateful enough to let me take my summers off, which is, again, the busiest time for us. So it started for me about 2009 is when uh, Archaeology Can You Dig It actually started. And my first client was actually um, Al Camp, which is out of Delaware. So uh, students from around Ohio, gifted and talented students, get invited to this camp at uh, Ohio Wesleyan, and they were the first ones to kind of take a chance and, and get the ball rolling. And I've been working with, I won't be working with them this summer. Uh, I did last summer, but that's, you know, it's, it's 10 years in working with them. And so I'm very grateful for, for them. So about 2009 is when it actually started uh, to take place with clients and actually uh, being compensated for doing it. Okay, all right, so you've been, this is not a new venture, you've been doing this for a while. No. So you, you no. <laughs> great. <Journey. laughs> um, it's, it's interesting that you touch on community support. So, you know, it's um, small business owners very often feel that they're isolated. They're handling this entire prospect on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a mind shift, first of all, because as employees, we're very um, compartmentalized. We focus on a single task within a much larger organization. So small business owners have to make up the entire team. They're responsible for everything from marketing to finance, you know, HR, the, the whole thing. So. Um, you had a team that was helping you, so not just you know a, an employer who understood the need to have summers off and providing you with resources. Um, can you talk about your team um, for um, archaeology? Um, can you dig it? You know, is it is yeah. it more than just you? And who is involved in that? Not names, well, but you know the roles and how did you fill yeah. those roles? So actually, uh, family is obviously integral. You know, your family is always going to be there to help you out. Uh, so they've done a tremendous job of helping me move this forward. Um, there is another individual that sort of works on the sort of the computer side or the website side or helping me create some supplies uh, like the castles and catapults. You know, everything has to be kind of made for it because the kids get to take that home. So I have someone there. But but honestly, you, you're right. You hit the nail on the head. It is uh, it is everything. You know, it's the marketing. It's the presentation. It's the cold calling. It's the. Uh, shopping for the supplies It's to making sure that you're sanitizing everything correctly, especially after COVID hit. Um, so, so there's a lot. So as far as the moving parts issue, it, it's me. Um, so I'll go in, I'll work with 30 students. I'll, I'll, sometimes it's been 50 students. And so it takes a lot of planning to make sure that you're going to have enough activities, uh, enough supplies uh, to keep everybody involved. Because you, the, the thing that you don't want is for kids to get bored. Uh, so if kids get bored and, and their, their eyes get, you know, a little laid over like they're going to sleep, then, then I'm not doing my job well. So it's it's a it's a lot of work for from that end as far as you know I have a home office so it's it's filled with supplies uh all the programs in there because we offer about 10 programs I think so all those programs have a different component and all have different supplies and everything that has to be done done for it so outside of those, those small knit group of individuals family and friends that are helping and um entities it's it's uh, pretty much me doing the moving parts. And that's actually, you know, that raises a point, a great point as well. That's another reason why I wanted to come to the library here because um, Columbus Metro Libraries have been a partner of mine in Archaeology Can You Dig It for over four years now. Um, we do Black History Month for them. We do every summer. Uh, this summer we'll have 18, we'll be doing 18 presentations with them again. Uh, at one point in time, we had 23, or I'm sorry, 21 of the 23 libraries. And uh, so that's the reason why I wanted to be here as well. The individual that uh, was a former manager here, uh, unfortunately, she's passed away. 
but she was the first one to put a flyer up for Archaeology Can You Dig It at the old uh, MOK branch, Martin Luther King branch down the street. So the libraries are very integral. Uh, Al Camp, ASC Group, uh, Girl Scouts have been integral for about four years. So just, you know, all these all these places have helped me move forward and um, very appreciative. So uh, along with that, working as a small business, trying to do everything, uh, it has to be it has to be perfection or, or as close to perfection as possible, because if not, people aren't going to call you back. And someone that's a, 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 such a small business like this and like, you know, I don't I don't get grants or anything. I, I got I was awarded one grant, which was uh, helpful through you all as well. So I should I should put you in there as well. Uh, the Ohio Small Business Administration, because you are wonderful as well. You've been very supportive as well. So but outside of that, it, it's kind of uh, me hustling and bustling and you know, coming up with different ideas like, oh, Castle and Catapults, kids would love this. Or, um, oh, okay, well, let's let's set up a residency where, where I can actually have kids excavate uh, out as well. So there's a plethora of schools that, you know, that I couldn't say enough about. Um, but as far as people that are actually working for the business inside on a daily uh, basis, it's generally about two, two or three people at most. Okay, all right. Thanks for that. Um, so do you also have um, an attorney and insurance um, agent or broker, um, a CPA maybe? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so you have to, some places you can't get in, like a lot of recreation centers, if you don't have business insurance to cover the, um, you know, everybody there, then you can't even get in. Um, I haven't really had an issue with any um, with any lawyers or any dealing with any of that. You know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it would probably be wise to have a lawyer um, just for, for GPs. But there, um, as far as now, that is that is not something that's in my repertoire. Okay, all right, excellent. So, um, and it's I love that you're describing um, community engagement and it's uh, this identifying a unmet need, an unsolved problem, which is you know this particular educational component um, throughout all of our um, education systems, and then you're establishing these really um, vital partnerships with those organizations, so everybody is benefiting from this. So it's, um, you know, a great model to highlight uh, because very often um, we have a tendency to try to bring our passion to a market mm -hmm. and maybe that market doesn't exist. And then we have this challenge, you know, how do we make this business viable when mm -hmm. fundamentally it isn't? So you are describing, you know, that perfect situation. So um, touching on grants, you mentioned that earlier that you did receive a grant and yeah. um, I'm going to guess that was probably a pandemic relief grant of some sort. So it was from the uh, Tony Foundation. And uh, okay. so it was, it was very helpful. Uh, again, you all can't say enough about you as well. So it was very, it was at a time that was needed. Obviously, you know, Corona hit. And uh, I think I think everybody's business took, took some kind of a hit through the two year process. Uh, so it was very helpful to obtain that. Um, but I am, I, I did see a question that just came up. So I'm, I'm a for-profit business. Uh, so a lot of times you can't get grants if you are and if you're a nonprofit business, you have more opportunities to get grants. Uh, but but me being a for profit business, um, that's the only one I've received uh, over this over this period. So it's a lot of and the reason, again, with the you know, with all the, the community engagement, this is archaeology can dig you. Can you dig it is all about the community. It's all about, um, you know, educating. Now, archaeology is is an anthropology is the backdrop of that. But. It's my passion is to educate kids and get them involved. Even if they're not uh, going to become an archaeologist or an anthropologist, it is, I kind of feel like it's still my duty to at least let you know that that's out there because science is a wonderful thing. Um, you know, it, you know, we, we joke, but even a, a lot of folks that are even adults think that archaeologists excavate for dinosaurs. You know, we have nothing to do with that. That's a paleontologist, but there's a lot of folks that uh, if I, if I had a, a dollar for every time I heard, oh, did you find any dinosaurs or you got to find it? Like, I'd probably be a rich man. But uh, so I think, you know, in seeing that it's it's um, it's needed to just explain what what we do, how it's important, um, you know, explain about the ethics. You know, there you can't just go and dig things up and um, just willy nilly just put them in your pocket and keep them. So there's a whole process. It is an actual it's a science. It's a social science. Uh, more so than a physical science, but it has to be done the correct way. And if you are, you know, someone that, you know, because I've, I've worked in a few cemeteries as well, sometimes remains have to be removed. Uh, so when you're in that situation, you need to make sure that you're ethical and you're doing everything the right way and you're recording everything. And that's kind of how I run this business as well. Um, you know, if I'm working with kids on, a, on an excavation, I just did a residency uh, a few weeks ago for, I had a school, there's only about 62 kids there. 
um, out in Yellow Springs, Ohio. So we worked, and it's the second time I've done excavation for them. So everything has to be done right. You know, the kids gripe about all the paperwork and uh, all the recording, and 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 it's you know it's a, it's a drag, but it has to be done. So so it's being done the right way. This science, but it's all about community engagement. Without the community, um, I'm also proud to be from Columbus, Ohio. I'm bringing that back here uh, to to work with the kids around here as well. But but without the community. Went out to support, you know, this this does this is non-existent. Yeah, I agree. I, we, nobody's an island. Well, most mm -hmm. nobody's an island. Um, <laughs> so, um, so you're for profit. So, like as you said earlier, you know, no grants for the for profit sector, or you know, very very few. Mm -hmm. um, so, how did you handle startup funding? So again, it's uh, you know, it's been a hard road. It's it still hasn't been totally figured out yet. Um, you know, being totally honest, it's still. A grind. Um, there are certain areas where uh, certain parts of the year or seasons that are a lot more busy than others. Um, there's there's times in a you know a couple of months out of the year where where you're like you know you're biting your fingernails, you're a little nervous. But uh, again, I'll, I'll just reiterate, you know, family has helped out quite a bit. You know, they have they have helped out with that. Um, and I started slow. You know, I've, I've, I've a lot of times I've had a part time job along with it to sort of help coincide from those tough uh, financial times in, in dealing with a small business. Uh, so I think for, for that fact, like a part-time job that I worked and, and just family support and, uh, and word of mouth as well is, is what helped me. So it was, is I, I'd love to say that, you know, it started immediately in 2009 with like this big lump of sum of money and like we've been rolling ever since, but, but that's just not, that's just not the case. So it was a, it was a long process um, I equate, you know, I'm I'm, for about, I'm getting ready to be 48, so I, you know, I, I use the old old uh, adage, and I and I say that it was kind of like selling, you know, cassettes out of the trunk. You know, in my day, like folks that were selling music and trying to get, you know, well known, it was like you know selling tapes out of the trunk. So it was a lot of cold calling, it was a lot of no's, um, a lot of disappointing no's. But then once the word kind of gets out and and people see the uh, product that you're offering and their passion that you have for offering it to it and and the way, quite frankly, that the kids respond to it and the adults that are there, um, I think that kind of eased, eased the pain of uh, actually finding clients and having to continuously try to find money, um, which would be very helpful. You know, so, you know, I'm put a little plug in if anybody's watching this or watches it later, wants to donate to this, like it would be very uh, helpful and we would thoroughly appreciate that and it would go to a great cause. But uh, again, for me, just to answer that again, it, it's... Uh, the startup money is kind of still, you know, it, it just it wasn't like overnight where this happened. It, it was a very long haul, and I've worked for uh, about three different science museums in the past as well. After I stopped working as an archaeologist in the field full time, um, so I think that helped me gain some. Clearly, it helped me gain some experience and some extra knowledge, and that's, that's how why I have a chemistry component to it as well, where uh, there are you know hands-on chemistry programming that kids can partake in as well. But I think that also helped me um, sort of build a clientele up to learn about uh, who could actually benefit from what's being offered. Excellent. So you've really put a lot of thought into your programming and what you're working with, who your customers are. So you, mm -hmm. um, you know, we always preach in understanding who your target market is and what makes them tick so that you can really connect with them and meet their needs. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, by extending yourself beyond archaeology into chemistry, you are um, taking a more holistic approach. So uh, that's Absolutely. great to hear. Um, and uh, you have the benefit, small businesses have the benefit of being more agile. So if it's just a small operation, it's just a single person, when you're faced with a challenge, you can adjust, you can, you know, shift and pivot and do whatever you need to do. So um, you mentioned, you know, working a part-time job because that's what makes the business work now. That's what sustains you and prevents the business from just collapsing entirely. So that's really valuable information. Uh, along those lines, when talking about pivoting, COVID was a challenge for every business all around the world, mm -hmm. nobody saw that coming and there was no precedent. There was no roadmap for how we deal with this. So how did you approach the pandemic? How did you pivot? How did you cope with that challenge? Uh, great question. So I did a lot of, I bought a camera. Um, so I got a camera and then I started doing virtual programming. Uh, so I had an opportunity to reach um, an entity basically associated with out of Sacramento, California. I've done one for UC Berkeley. I've done one for the Jack and Jill program here in Columbus as well. So for me, and it took a, it took some thought, it took some time. You know, I, I was uh, like everyone else, nervous, and uh, and I kind of just to, to to like, oh, how can I get there? You know, you can't be around kids. It's all about being around kids. 
So for me, it was to purchase a, a new camera that um, that I could do virtual virtual programming with, and just kind of kind of wait it out. And there, you know, it, it wasn't easy. It was um, a lot of oh, is this? Are we coming back? You know, is this? Are we able to do this? And then so I also did a series uh, with the same camera at my at my you know home office basically, and I did a three part series on Facebook. Uh, each one was at least 45 minutes, close to an hour, some of them, but I talked about lab work. Um, I talked about artifacts. I even uh, set up excavations in my backyard and recorded that so kids could see that. So it was basically a three-part series just to keep people involved uh, in what we were doing. And then also we traveled to, uh, you know, first African-American school in the Northwest Territory, and we met a wonderful woman named Lucy, so we recorded her and recorded the school there. So everything was kind of moved to a virtual, sort of like a virtual um, outing or outlet basically for me at that point in time. And then, you know, it, you know, finally, then clients after, after folks start getting back in the schools or the churches or the libraries or, you know, wherever they were, wherever they were at, they were starting to call back. And I think that is um, because of the product that's offered. I think that they were loyal because of what they saw before, so they came back. But it was very, it was it was a very nervous time, and like I said, for me, I had to do a come up with a virtual component that I could still reach kids, and uh, also it was it felt great to be outside of our state to be able to present what what we were doing as well. So for me, it was a virtual thing. Okay, so in some ways, the uh, pandemic created an opportunity. I mean, you've explored new avenues and you know, going digital. Um, mm -hmm. having a national um, presence working in your own backyard. So mm -hmm. uh, would are you retaining um, those um, new avenues, these new approaches? Yeah, so not not so much uh, with virtual programming. Um, I think folks are just happy to be back in person again. And it's it's a lot safer now than it was. So we so I, I generally use the camera for either recording, like I record, you know, folks that, that are that I'm presenting to or take a plethora of pictures, you know, on the Facebook that I use and Instagram, you know, there's thousands of pictures, you know, it's, um, so I, I generally use it for that. I don't, I don't really do a lot of more, a lot more virtual programming as I did then. I would, you know, I would, if, if anyone was interested in that, like if, if, especially out of state, I'm all for it. But I think within um, our state and um, the states that are surrounding us that are close and around in our city, I think it's a lot more hands-on now. So a lot less uh, virtual programming for myself. Okay, makes sense. And, uh, yeah. Um, can you talk about the challenges of running an educational program? And I ask because education is typically nonprofit um, or you know, private schools. So you're unique, as you mentioned earlier, you're not a nonprofit, but you're providing educational content. So mm -hmm. what kind of challenges do you experience with that and how do you cope with them? Um, so it's, for, for me, I guess, I, I, I do a lot of uh, after school programs as well for, for schools. Um, for me, the, a, a big challenge is, you know, like like I mentioned, there's probably thirty about thirty one uh, clients or organizations that I have scheduled between June and the beginning of August, maybe the middle of August. So I'm grateful for that. It's a wonderful thing. Um, but there's so many that you have to turn a lot of people down because you're you've already booked all those dates. So for me, the challenge is making um, making making the clients understand that we need you throughout the year also, um, not just the summer, the summer months. And again, those entities that I mentioned before keep us um, working throughout the year. But I would love to have more of a, um, more of clientele that, that call also throughout the entire year. There's there's a few one, the few that, that do as well. Uh, there's another one, Ethiopian organization that 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 uh, supports us as well. So they're throughout the year also. But for me, I guess it's, it's, it's building that, um, bridge to go throughout the, you know, 365 days. Now, no one works 365 days, but but that year process to, to have these folks that are calling at that time as well, instead of, because um, everyone needs stuff to do in the summer. You know, that's schools are out. Um, they're looking for programming, but I, I just wish that would be there as well. As far as uh, the schools are concerned, I guess, sometimes it, it can be difficult if you don't have a relationship with that particular school. It can be difficult uh, getting them to understand that what you're offering is sometimes something that they um, can't do the same way or that it can benefit, you know, archaeology and even anthropology is science, it's math, it's history. 
it's uh it, it's anatomy when you're dealing with you know like if you're talking about burial pitch like discussing what that's all about um so i think sometimes it can be difficult to get that point across to them like no this is this is this is going to uh, be a plus and a benefit that can go inside with or coincide with what you're doing also. It's just a different way of teaching and educating. Because another thing, teachers are great. Schools are great. They're wonderful places. Um, we all can probably talk about six teachers that we loved, you know, growing up. But um, I think one thing that I learned working in, in science museums is that sometimes we educate differently there. Um, you know, whether you're doing science theater or whether you're holding a class, um, so there's there's just different ways to think of educating sometimes, and uh, a lot of us are, are always hands on with with th that type of education. So I think sometimes it can be difficult to uh, display that to to individuals that may not have that experience with that. Okay, excellent. Um, so what mo motivates you and keeps you passionate about your business? You know, when you're looking at getting a part time job to get you through a rough spot, you know, what keeps you mm -hmm. going every day? What keeps you from hanging up that out of business sign? Yeah, I, I just love, I love working with the kids and teaching them uh, what I love. You know, it's it's every day isn't the same. It's, it's, it's you know, like, for instance, oh, I'm, I'm into oh forensics. Oh, OK, well, let's let's do this, you know, facial reconstruction with, with these students. And then I can be passionate about it and excited about it. And they can as well. And I don't feel like I've uh, wasted time getting an archaeology or anthropology degree. I get to work in my field. Uh, science is cool. You know, in chemistry, you get to. You know, you can't, there's no blast shield, so you can't blow up anything, but you know, you can do, you can make things react and uh, it may, it keeps me young. And I, and I just like seeing the kids that are, you know, grasping what I'm doing and they, they want to be there, you know, to come up and give you a hug or they're like, uh, you know, are you coming back next week? You know what I mean? So those kind of things keep me going and, uh, and it's for, it's for everybody, you know, it's for, it's for all kids, but I also want to make sure that I'm reaching that uh, group of, of students that may not be able to go to, you know, take a field trip out to Sunwatch or Fort Ancient or, you know, Cahokia out of this state, you know, I, I want to be able to bring it to them. And, uh, and for them to be, again, going back to what I said, if it's not, you know, no one's perfect. But if you're if you're striving for that or something close to that, then you're, you're probably going to be satisfied with your product. And, and for me dealing with with the kids and having them actually react, um, even within this library that I'm at now, um, it's, it's, it keeps me happy and it keeps me going and it makes me feel fulfilled. One thing that I will say is that, you know, whether it's a week long residency or a week long summer camp or a two hour presentation or an hour presentation, if you're not, you know, if, if, if I'm not tired at the end of that, then I feel like I didn't do the job well because kids are going, if you're doing, if you're educating kids the right way and you're, you're giving them a product that you believe in, then you're going to give it your all. You know, your voice is going to be a little dry at the end of that. You know, you're going to be a little tired. You might need to have a little more Gatorade or, you know, have a bigger dinner at night. So for me, it's all about um, getting them involved in it, you know, because if they if they weren't happy, um, you know, then, then I'm not happy. And it doesn't it doesn't fulfill the mission why I developed this, which was to, you know, I think it's successful because of the mission. The mission was to teach, you know, thousands of kids. The mission was to educate folks that may not be able to you know, visit your local museum and to bring this to them and have them, you know, speak on, you know, retain what you taught them and, and it, or, or sync, write you, make you a card or a letter, or, you know, can you put this on your refrigerator? So for me, it is, um, I, I see success in, in watching the kids uh, gain what I'm trying to deliver to them through this product. Okay, that's nice. Uh, you're describing a genuine passion for what it is that you are doing. Um, and so often we, we will explain that it's really important to have that passion because if you, uh, if a business is, someone's starting a business just because they want to make money, is the passion there for making widgets? Because if not, you know, is the money really going to be sufficient? Is that really going to motivate you to get out there and make widgets and sell them every mm -hmm. single day? Um, and you're describing feedback. You have this is constant, you keep making reference to the feedback that you're getting mm -hmm. and it's, a, I, if everybody should recognize the value of that feedback and you should I, I be happy that you are doing that. Um, we have a tendency to not accept feedback because we're doing our thing our way and it's about us. Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're starting from us and working out. You are looking at outside of what you're giving them. 
and mm -hmm. taking in that feedback and then turning around and giving them more of what it is that they're asking for. So that feedback loop is so vital to um, the success of a business. So I'm really pleased to hear you say that. Thank you. Um, so what do you like um, most about operating your own small business? And what do you like least about that? Um, I, I, I guess I like most is it's my, you know, archaeology is my passion. You know, it's um very interesting field of science, you know, anthropology also, obviously, if you're an archaeologist, you're an anthropologist first. Uh, you don't have to be an archaeologist to be an anthropologist. There are five disciplines of that. But to be, to get your degree in archaeology, you have to uh anthropology is part of that and then you specialize in archaeology so just the, just just all the interesting things that that um that i've read in the past or like that interests me or like going to visit you know serpent mound or just and just the feeling of being there and just just for me just sort of running my mind back to um what these people were actually doing at one particular time in history and trying to figure out again trying to put that puzzle together and keeping um you know, understanding the importance of that and also understanding that they weren't, you know, prehistoric peoples weren't much different than us. Um, so, you know, a lot of the same things that we do, they did just in different ways. Um, you know, so for me, it's just that passion of of working uh, in, in the field of archaeology in whatever, you know, in, in whatever way that I can do that and being able to give that back. I think the least would be um, always trying to find, uh, you know, your financial ground. And it's always a go. You know, you always have to look for more clients, for new clients. You always have to make sure everybody's 100% satisfied again. Um, and so that that grind, just just like any other small business or any other business, is probably a little difficult. Um, obviously, everybody's going to be spending a lot of time on their small business. So I don't mind that because it's, you know, the time that you're spending on it is going to make what you're doing grow. So I don't, I don't mind that at all, but I think sometimes trying to, you know, because I, I don't, we don't really ask for donations, you know, I, I probably should set up a donation page, but uh, we don't really get any of that. So I think that that continuous grind of just feeling like, okay, if you're not getting this, then, you know, I might have to call it quits or do something else. So I think that for me is probably uh, my least favorite, but that's just, unfortunately, you know, that's just business, it's capitalism. Uh, everybody has to deal with it. You just have to figure out how to navigate that and figure out your best way of being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and I, I know there are channels that will follow on like YouTube and they're frequently asked, you know, be a, you know, support us through Patreon, be a sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, mm -hmm. understanding that there's so much more that goes into creating that 30 minute piece of content than just that 30 minutes of recording um, and supporting that and how vital it is that we do that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's going to plug this um, computer. Okay. Um, so, um, what do you wish everyone knew um, about being a business owner? Uh, the the satisfaction that you can get from it, um, the satisfaction, um, the the freedom. Sometimes, you know, you have you have more as far as your time. You have a little more freedom sometimes to be able to do some things in your life that you may, uh, you know, not be able to do if you're not doing that. Um, it's fun. You know, it's, it's, it's more fun than not being fun because, um, because it's something that you created and people are buying into it and they are, uh, you know, happy with your offering. So for me, it's, 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 it's that, um, again, it's, uh, you can stay in your field, whatever you, you know, no one, I don't think anyone's really going to start a business that they're not interested in or that they don't, uh, find, um, excitement in. So for me, I think it, it's it's that just just um, being able to come up with so you you know you brought something in the world that that wasn't there before, and um, it, it's it's you know long after I'm gone you know it, it'll if someone you know if someone wanted to be an archaeologist and 50, 60, 80 years from now like well let's look up here and see what this was about like it's still there <laughs> so um so for me that that kind of makes me happy to leave something uh, here and 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 it's you know it's it's uh. For me, that I think that's it. Just trying to get to that point where, um, you know, it just it just where everybody just buys in and believes and is like, man, this is a wonderful thing. And I, and I think it's, I, I think we are there. Um, I think a lot of folks. That's why they they call it back. It's a lot of word of mouth. Um, so so I think for me with that is, uh, I think I would answer with that as far as putting something in the world that 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 I see is at least positive. 
um, helpful to kids to help them grow and to um, keep moving on from there would be my, my answer to that. Nice. So you're describing creating a legacy, you know, just the yeah. the lives that you that you touch. But you know, the benefit of the digital world, we can live forever on yeah. <laughs> our digital exactly. platform. So um, exactly. Let me plug this in really quickly because I think okay. my okay. is almost out of here. Okay. A um, couple of comments here from. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Chat. Um, Mike asks, um, given your use of recording during the pandemic, are you still implementing these practices in addition to live? I think we touched on uh, that, but is it a formal component or is it just sporadic? Uh, it, I, I guess it would be. It would seem more of a, a sporadic thing. I, again, I haven't had to do it so much with uh, people being in person again. Again, I'd love to. Like I, I you know, if anybody is like, well, we can't reach you virtually. Uh, there was there was a summer camp last year out of New York, and an archaeologist that I'd met, and so she couldn't do the summer camp, and she had uh, passed along my information, and I, clearly I agreed. But it, it just didn't transpire. We were going to do that virtually as well. Um, but, you know, for me, you know, I, I, I love being in person because I, I like to have that feedback and that, that, that reaction quickly. Um, some of the programming options, you know, like Puzzle Pots works really well virtually. Uh, dig Pits won't because, you, you know, you don't have the, that organization won't have any Dig Pits to dig into. Uh, obviously, you know, the spear throwing at ladders won't work. Um, but facial reconstruction would work. So some, a lot of the programs that I do are have a main like hands-on focus that are very kind of easier to do in person. But um, but there are things that you can do virtually. Like I said, I did the puzzle pots. You could do the artifact show and tell. I can do uh, you know the Facebook recording again. So I, I haven't um, closed that down that door, shut that door at all. But um, it, it's just been a lot of hands-on things where where I hadn't had the opportunity to get back virtually to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it makes sense because um, we 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 learn by doing. You mm -hmm. know, so much of school is spent, you know, looking at a book, you know, watching a video. So when young people have an opportunity to get their hands dirty and actually try this thing, it's a completely different experience. Um, Absolutely. And you know, uh, anthropology, archaeology, it really most of it is well. I don't say most of it, but the exciting part is out there in the dirt, you know, in the puzzle <laughs> yep. together, not not in the library. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but um, it's just, it's, uh, you know, it's just, it, and that's, you know, also that's why I like to, because um, all kids won't have an opportunity to work on an excavation or volunteer. You know, you should always obviously have an archaeologist there uh, working with you so they can, you know, tell you the correct way to do things. But all kids won't even get to, you know, the opportunity to volunteer at an archaeological site because a lot of sites you can volunteer at, you know, we, we need to help. You know, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of work in, a, in, a, in an archaeological uh, excavation. You know, there's, there's a lot. So there's, you know, they're always a lot of times asking for volunteers to come out there, but that's also why I make my uh, program so authentic and try to make sure that they um, are, or you can't be outside digging unless you, you know, you've scheduled with me an excavation, but that's why I try to direct my programming so that it's so much like what we would be doing outside. So they get that concept and then that kind of that real world uh, experience, um, even if it's hands-on through, you know, working in the library or like an inside building, uh, they can still get the best opportunity uh, from that, if that makes sense. Yeah, perfect. Um, and Tanya asked, you mentioned donations a couple of times. Have you thought about um, formalizing a complimentary 501c3? I have not, but I, I appreciate that advice and I will actually delve into that, that information and look more into that as well. Okay, excellent. Um, um, Thank you. What's the most surprising thing you've learned about running a small business? Uh, um, I mean, honestly, you know, from the from the beginning, uh, I, I guess honestly, all the work. You know, it's uh, you know, when I first started, it's like, okay, you know, this is, you know, again, like I mentioned, I used to work for Columbus Public School System. You know, before I graduated, and you know, all that business worked for them. You know, like 1999, way back then, for about three years. And so then, you know, got into the field of archaeology, you know, decades of that. And then, you know, so coming into this, I, I kind of thought because I had that experience, you know, working with schools and archaeology, that it, that it would be a little bit easier um, to delve into doing a business like this. And uh, not not easy because it's never easy doing anybody's business, but, but I thought it'd be a little bit an easier trick. Um, so, so I think for me, and it, it may be, you know, maybe all small business owners feel this way, is that it's a lot of work. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's always on your mind. 
you know, even if you're, you can be watching a football game and then something cross your mind, like, oh, this activity, all right, let me write this down. Oh, this might work well, but it, it is a, it is a constant thing. You know, it's, it's, it's constant because you care about it. You know, it's your, it's your baby. So um, with that, I think just the, the amount of work that goes into it constantly, it can, it, you know, it, consume may not be the right word, but sometimes it consumes you because you want it to be successful and you want it to work. Um, so for me, you know, just, you know, and that was, that was earlier on, I wouldn't say that now, but earlier on, it was a lot of, uh, a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. Okay. Uh, so you, you talked about, um, business consuming you. How do you balance having a personal life and then your, your person, your business life? And is there any balance? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think sometimes, you know, you, you have to, uh, you know, quite, quite frankly, I, I never really get summers anymore. Um, you know, you get time. Summers are a whirlwind for me because there, there's so many people that are scheduled that, you know, starting in about a month, you know, it goes until August, like constantly, like four, four or five a week, you know, out of town, um, a lot of travel. And I think the furthest library that I'll be doing this, this summer is about two hours away in Elyria. Um, but there'll be some other ones out of town as well. So I think sometimes you just kind of have to force yourself to shut it off. Um, and for me, you know, it, it's, it, it's, I think it's important because it also will help your creativity. And, um, you know, again, it, it consumes you. It's always there. You know, you can't really ever get away from it because it's there. It stares at you in the face when you get home. You know, emails or someone's call or calls, but um, I guess for me, yeah, it would be sometimes you just have to kind of force yourself to to shut it down, um, even if it's just for a few hours out of the day, or or a day or two. You know, it's uh, but but I think it's and sometimes sometimes you you need that time just to again uh, be a little more creative or or step back, take a step back and look and say what um, you know what you could be doing better or or what you you know or what could be changed a little bit different. And also I wanna bring up um, two, two, two schools. Um, so Franklin Business School uh, years ago, and uh, most recently the Brown School Business School at Ohio State. So I had the opportunity for some students that are uh, both locations, just one you know years before, one years after. So I had the opportunity for these business uh, marketing students to create a plan for take this business. You know, I wasn't the only one, would take this business and show me what, oh, this is great. Or maybe you can do this a little bit better or a little bit different because there's, you know, I'm, I'm 48, you know, so they're like, and they're younger 20. So they're, they're doing a different thing with like media and like websites and like, well, maybe you don't need to use so many pictures. People might not look at them all anyway. So I, I think um, I was very uh, grateful to have them be able to have me take a step back and look and be like, oh, I could do this a little bit different, or this could make my life a little bit easier doing this. So things like that, even, even in entities like that and situations like that help you to turn it off for a minute and just, you know, have somebody else hold, you know, carry your baby for a second, and then you can learn from them. So, so I think sometimes it's very important to, to, you know, give yourself some time and shut it off. And, and, you know, you come back stronger sometimes when you do that, I think. Okay. Do you ever get to take a vacation? Oh, uh, well, I went to visit my parents last uh, after summer, after the, after the summer run last last uh, year. I went to visit my parents, so that was uh, that's always fun and, and and great. They live in Florida, so you know the beach was nice and seeing seeing my mom and dad. And but uh, outside of that, you know, maybe maybe some some day trips, you know, <laughs> some dates or some things like that. You know, <laughs> you, you are committed to that business, or you, or you are saddled with it. Depends on how you look at it, right? Right. I agree. Um, so how does the reality of running a small business compare with your expectations? Um, I think I think it's pretty much aligned. Um, you know, again, I, I, I didn't think it was going to be so difficult um, at the beginning of this. But but I think, you know, over time, you know, as time passes and goes by, you realize, like, you know, if you really want this, you know, you're, you're going to have to, you know, put put your whole heart and effort into it. You know, you're, you're going to have to be there at you know, you just got to be there. You got to, you got to, you got to shoot for the stars to make sure everybody's happy. Um, you know, you can't, cause one, one, you know, one, say you, you know, you say you have 30 kids at a presentation and, and they all hate it and, and the, everybody's frowning at you. You know, that's, that's all it kind of takes for somebody to be, oh, well, you know, maybe this isn't what we thought it was going to be. So, so for me, I, I think that is, um, 
just just striving for you know striving for for, for everyone has a different reality of greatness or what they think it is um but but each individual's uh definition of that um i think i think is important and i i, I just try to I try to do that with it and i think that is needed you know i think that um again so much you know so so many times you know people's history is is overlooked or or seen as less than or or even more than and it's just like it, you know everybody everybody's here is, is important everybody's lineage is important um their ethnicity you know it's uh it's very important i like to say to the kids you know through anthropology like you know a good question i ask them is like how many races are there in the world you know like how many races do you think there are and you know you should a thousand you know 16 or you know a million and it's like no you know there's one you know there's a human race and there's a bunch of different ethnicities and cultures within this human race and um and so from that standpoint that hopefully lets them understand that like you know all of our history and culture is important there's a reason why you know anthropologists and archaeologists exist you know there was a you know in the beginning stages there were some things that could be frowned upon as far as the field is concerned but i think uh where we're at now and and you know much much that was a long time ago as well but where we're at now it's, it's just important because we you know we we tell the truth you know because the ground is going to tell the truth whatever's down there in that ground what we're excavating out um when we're researching again to put that puzzle together it's going to tell the truth it's going to it's going to it's going to explain everything if you're if you know how to read it and then it, like any science and any scientist things get changed so you know theories may change um people might look at things a little differently like oh i think this was used for this now not necessarily it was used for, this artifact was used for this not necessarily this so I just think that it's important for us to all to understand that, you know, history does a lot of great. We, we do destroy the ground, honestly. You know, we, we all know that because we're digging it up. You can't get it back. So that's another reason as to why it should be done uh, respectfully, ethically, um, and and know what you're doing, you know? So so for me, it's, it's uh, I want to I want to see more archaeologists. You know, it's, um, you know, being perfectly honest, a lot of people probably don't go into archaeology because, it, it, you're, you're not going to get rich, you know, I'm just perfectly honest, you know, it's, it's not like Indiana Jones, you know, I love the movies, we all love Indiana Jones, but it's not, it's nothing like that, you know, there's some great sites, and there's some sites that you wish you would never have to be at, but that's, that's archaeology, because you're at the mercy of the environment, you know, you're, you're in the woods, you know, you're in, you're in 100 degree weather, you're in 13 degree weather, you're hiking in an hour to get to a project, and working eight, seven hours, and then working an hour back out, so it's not um if you you know if you're trying to get rich or whatnot then you know this may not be the field for you you know it's it's uh i wish that coming out of college that we would be compensated more obviously it depends on if you have a bachelor's or master's or if you're going for a phd but um i just i think it would be a lot more helpful for uh folks in the i'll, I'll stick with our country and our country to recognize the importance of it and once that once that comes about, I think that uh, we'll be more, uh, we'll be compensated a little bit better as college graduates, like like other degrees. And that, that's, again, why I do this as well, is to create that, um, you know, create that community of people that understand what we do and, and how hard it is. You know, I, I worked also at, you know, you know, the, there's a project in New Albany that we worked on recently. And so there, there was a, uh, you know, there was a, an individual, a woman that lived across the street from where we were working on our unit. And uh, me and this other guy that were doing field work out there, you know, she was, she's like, you all are working your fingers off. And uh, like, yeah, you know, like it's, it's not easy, but, um, but it's worth it. You know, it's worth it. You know, you get to go, you get to travel. It's a lot of hotel living at first and whatnot, but, um, you know, I feel, I feel lucky enough to have worked in uh, over 50 projects and in 16 different states multiple times. And you don't have to leave the country, you know, to work in archaeology. There's plenty of archaeology here in the United States. You know, it's great to go outside of the country as well. And there's great archaeology out there and, you know, classicals and, you know, in, in Europe and whatnot, which is awesome. But there's plenty of archaeology here in the States as well. So, you know, that's another thing I want to point out is that you don't have to uh, work out of the country to be an archaeologist and you can there's many ways that you can do it you can work at museums you can do this you can do outreach program which is what this is you can work for cultural resource management firms um you can work for the government you know so there's lots of jobs that are out there uh, you just have to be willing to uh put in the grind and realize that it's it's a blue collar and a white collar job you know it's it's 
you know, you're going to, you're going to have some snakes, you're going to have some ticks, you're going to have some, uh, all that's poison ivy, you know, all that stuff that you, uh, have to face is out there, but because what's out there, uh, what we're, what we're looking for, I'm sorry, is out there, you know, it's, it's in the environment. So, but it's worth it. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm proud that, um, I had a great time at my university. Um, I've met some great friends that I'm still friends with that are archaeologists and some people that are have way more knowledge than me. Um, I appreciated uh, I appreciate this interview. I appreciated uh, the paper I did for Society of American Archaeology and you know Ohio Archaeology Council and whatnot. So I just you know I'm, I'm just very appreciative, and I just want everybody wh whoever is watching this or whoever watches this later just to understand that you know I, I'm a humble person, um, but this is this is something that is is really it, you know, it's really awesome. You know, it reaches a lot of, of folks. It, it does a lot of good, and it's and it's um, and it's done well. And um, and and I feel that it brings uh, archaeology and anthropology, and again, the chemistry component to uh, a wide range of ages of students that uh, get a lot from it. That's awesome. Um, I like you know. I ask you the question. You know, how does running a small business compare to your expectation? And mm -hmm. ordinarily, there would be uh, you know a series of you know comparisons. I have no free time now. Uh, I never have the money that I thought I was going to have. Um, <laughs> um, I, it's difficult dealing with clients. And you didn't mention any of that. Everything that you talked about was you, you can summarize as you know your passion for what you're doing. And I made some quick notes here. Um, you doing what you do with integrity. Um, you're giving to people. Um, you are not. Well, you certainly need to make money and you want to be, you know, a yeah, for sure. supporting business. That mm -hmm. was never your emphasis here. You were talking about giving people um, this opportunity. Um, the importance of the people, being grateful for the opportunity, what it is that you're doing, uh, making it real and accessible for um, people who wouldn't ordinarily have the opportunity to explore um, archaeology. Um, and I didn't. I never did. It was never on the curriculum. It was never mentioned. Mm -hmm. It may have been touched on in a history class, mm -hmm. but it was you know, never right. an opportunity. So. Um, I love that you are you know, encapsulating your entire experience about the joy of doing what you do, not about the money that you make. So your emphasis, I think, is is so important and really um, shapes the way you think and you approach your um, business. Um, Thanks. A couple of comments here from um, Kat. Uh, you talked earlier about it's not Indiana Jones, so I'm guessing there's no Ark of the Covenant. You've not found that. Not not quite no. yet. I'm still I'm still okay. looking. <laughs> Okay. I wish it but, was more. <laughs> soon. You know, it could be a new Albany. You never know. You that know, is true. That place is... <laughs> all the time. Or my backyard. Could have been yeah, the backyard. Yeah. 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 I've got a sweater I lost in 87. I'm still looking <laughs> for. So, but Teresa wants to know what is the most interesting thing you have ever dug up? So, again, with, um, you know, I've found, found a lot of artifacts, a lot of, a lot of pottery, a lot of projectile points, um, flakes or what. Flakes and debitage are what falls off when someone's flint napping to make the projectile points. Um, for me, honestly, and, and very reverent, it was, um, I, I enjoy working in cemeteries. Um, you know, I do, I'm not a forensic anthropologist. Like I, I have some programs that sort of delve into that, but um, I, I, I enjoy, you know, um, I, I, I enjoy working in, in cemeteries. And because sometimes, again, people have to be removed. Um, People have to, you know, whatever the situation is, you know, you're going to find information about that. And it's, and it's, it's very, you know, you have to be very, again, very reverent with that and, and um, very respectful with that also, because you're dealing with someone's uh, family members remains or what may be left of it. But for me, um, that was that, that, that's probably what's most interesting to me about that. I've, you know, I've worked in one in Columbus, I've worked in one in Pennsylvania. Um, I think actually probably two in Pennsylvania. And so for me, it's that because you're also like, for instance, you're, you know, if someone needs to be moved out, you know, you're, you're there as a scientist to do everything you need to do to, to be able to, you know, take them out. And these are bones that we're dealing with, obviously, but, and then to move them somewhere else. But even as an archaeologist, you know, we have to have you know, I can't just leave this interview now and, and go work in a cemetery or go work on a site. We have, you know, you have to get a permit. Um, you know, this, this is a federal charge. You know, we even had to take a law class uh, before we could graduate because you have to know the certain laws of areas. So even as archaeologists, we can't just go dig and like pot hunt and loot and whatnot. But uh, for me, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this as well, there was, um, now I wasn't, I wasn't the curator on this project, but once we uh, worked in this particular cemetery, um there was 
a, you know, so the curator at the time, unfortunately, he's, he's passed away as well. He was a great guy. But um, so he had all of her uh, remains and bones that were laid out. And at the, what she did have one was her wedding ring. And so that alone right there, you know, it's like till death do his part, you know, like it, it is, it's all again, all about a puzzle and like putting the story together and like, what were these people doing? And so those types of things are, are, are exciting. But as far as um, time period sites, I, I enjoy prehistorics. Um, you know, I love historics and the university I went to, we had a, we're, we're majority historic, you know, it's, it's in Pensacola, Florida. So it's a city of five flags. There's a lot of folks that live there and uh, occupy that, that area uh, there as well. But, you know, sometimes with the historic sites, you'll have maps, um, you'll have information that's already been written down in that. And then sometimes with prehistoric sites, you have to kind of use a, the information is that's ready available, if that makes sense. So in archaeology, there's generally, you know, a phase one, which a phase one is just kind of like a survey. We're doing a survey, a grid that we're covering to see if anything is of, of major importance is found. If there's some uh, very important or pertinent information, then we're going to do a phase two. So we're opening up units, you know, one by one, things of that nature. And then once you hit a phase three, uh, you know, you're doing mitigation. So you're out there like full blown, you know, archaeological site, everything, units, trenches or whatnot are being used. And um, so for me, you know, I, 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 I think I, I enjoy uh, prehistorics the most, if that if that makes sense. OK, so, so lots of human remains. I'm sorry. Lots of human remains. Right? Yeah, well, uh, you know, also with that, though, to be, you know, to be perfectly honest, I, I've, you know, these are all historic, uh, obviously all historic cemeteries as well. So that's another point. I'm glad you said that. So there is, um, you know, there's there's something that's called NACRA, so Native American Grave Protection Act. Um, so obviously we know before that uh, some of, some people's burials were being not treated as well as they should have by individuals that are not archaeologists, you know, individuals that are, you know, pot hunters or looters. And so this came into play to protect their, you know, their their sites and their burials, which should have absolutely, you know, a thousand percent. And uh, so never really, you know, haven't delved into that because there's a lot that that goes with that, say that um, in ethics as well, again, with that. So for me, uh, my cemeteries have been obviously historic. Um, it's a whole, whole different thing when you're getting into uh, American Indian or Native American burials that you have to um, deal with that as well. So if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, so uh, we're, we're right at 1.30 here. I want to be respectful okay. of, of your time. Um, okay. One last question for you, though. If there yeah, was sure. one piece of advice that you could give to someone who is considering starting their own business, what would that piece of advice be? Uh, get, get, uh, make sure you have some tough skin, you know, make sure that you can, um, make sure that you don't get too, make sure you don't get too high and don't get too low, you know, um, cause sometimes things are great and sometimes things are not. So if you try to stay even keel as much as you can, you know, don't enjoy the highs too much. Don't enjoy the low, you know, don't regret the lows too much. Uh, just try to stay in that 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 you know middle wave and try to learn from both. Learn from the positives, you know, the highs, and also learn from the lows. And try to also keep not necessarily reinventing yourself, but make sure that your you know whether your product or like whatever your business is, make sure that it's relevant and that you're keeping up with the times. You know, that that would be my advice. Excellent, thank you. So you're talking thank about you. you're living in the moment and recognizing that this moment is temporary. Things are going to change. So absolutely heading one way or the other. That's, absolutely. <laughs> oh, great. Um, so thanks for taking time out of your day to be here. Um, again, uh, if you uh, joined us late in the program, this is I'm Jeff Smith with Archaeology. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, dig it? And mm -hmm. um, if you want some more information about Jeff and his program, feel free to reach out to me, um, bwalters at cscc.edu, and I will provide you with Jeff's information. Um, if you are interested, we have a second uh, regular monthly installment of our Small Business Spotlight later this month, and that will be with Esther Salata of Benesse Solutions, who is providing an all-natural um, solution for um, fleas and ticks in your backyard. So um, I'm, I'm told that it's a lovely citronella cedar and proprietary blend. So if uh, you're interested in joining um, us for that um, spotlight, please let us know. 
Um, and with that, we're two minutes over, so we will wrap things up. Jeff, again, thanks for being here. It really was a pleasure. Yeah. Loved um, talking with you and learning about your business. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for everybody who watched now and everybody who watches later. Like, I truly appreciate you all. You're great for the city as well. You help uh, small businesses move along, and uh, we're grateful to have you. And again, thanks for everybody being here and the great questions and uh, just being interested in, in uh, my little small business uh, makes me happy. So I, I thoroughly appreciate it. And uh, anytime you need anything, let me know and I'll be there for you all. Excellent. Thank you. Everybody have all a great right, Thank one. you. You too. See you later.